welcome uh, to this afternoon's webinar. Um, we have, are very excited to have Dr. Nancy Fry here with us this afternoon. But before we start, um, let's just uh, go over some housekeeping items. Uh, my name is Laura Egan. I am the Product uh, Director for Product Management for Vocabulary for Success. And very excited to know Dr. Fry and be working with her. Um, this afternoon, the webinar for the webinar, all the phones will be placed on mute to help with the hearing and the, of the presentation. Um, there will also be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions uh, while you're listening, please write them down in the question box or in the chat box, I should say, in your control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. So there's a chat box there. So just write your questions down, and we will retrieve them. Also, this webinar will be recorded, and the link will be sent to you in a follow-up email. So let's begin. Um, we are happy to have Dr. Nancy Fry uh, with us today to present on the topic of vocabulary and the importance of the Common Core State Standards. Dr. Fry is a professor of literacy in the School of Ed Teacher Education at San Diego State University. She's also a classroom teacher at Health and Science High and Middle College. Dr. Fry is the recipient of an Early Career Achievement Award from the National Reading Conference and a co-recipient of the Krista McAuliffe Award for Excellence in Teacher Education from the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. Nancy has co-authored many professional books and articles and is the co-author of Sadlier's vocabulary program, Vocabulary for Success. Nancy, welcome, and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Laura. I'm happy to be here today as well. Um, I think what we're going to do now is uh, switch over computers, and hopefully what you'll be able to see in front of you are um, the visuals that I'll be using as I talk this afternoon. The, as you know, the goal around uh, the Common Core State Standards, uh, which began in their development a couple of years ago, was through a group of uh, educators um, coming together and saying, you know, we've got to find a way to be able to create some standards that we can hold in common across states so that we can have conversations outside of our own local communities about how education should develop and what are some strategies that we can use and those sorts of things. What are materials that we can share? And their goal overall was really to make sure that the Common Core State Standards were fewer in number were clearer in terms of the vision that they articulated and that most importantly were higher. In other words, more rigorous, um, holding students to a higher standard um, as well, which at times I think um, causes all of us to have a bit of concern along the way. Goal overall um, uh, is, and I'll, I'll put this in a different way, um, in a way that we like to talk with students about, is uh, that we want students to be able to read like a detective and write like a reporter. Um, we want them to be able to read for deep meaning those kinds of texts that we deem as being worthy of their attention. It's important to note that not every text uh, should be considered um, a worthy text that uh, requires that kind of deep reading. But we need to get students um, accustomed to how it is that you approach text that has layers of meaning to it to really be able to pull out those clues and those cues. And vocabulary pays a, a big role in all of this. In addition, we want students to be able to write like a reporter. In other words, that they're really able to to write both in terms of accuracy, um, formulating argument, finding uh, reasons to support their claims. Uh, we want them to be able to write in ways that help them to make themselves understood to others. And again, vocabulary plays an important role in that, both in reading and in writing. Um, the Common Core State Standards overall in English language arts are arranged into these four domains, reading, writing, speaking and listening, and language. And um, they're 
they're tied together through what are called anchor standards. These anchor standards are intended to go from kindergarten to 12th grade and in, in my mind they really represent um, a, a revolutionary way for us to be able to talk not only across state lines, uh, which is the idea around the common part of the Common Core, but especially to be able to talk to our fellow educators even within our own communities, within our own buildings. Because these anchor standards run the same from kindergarten to 12th grade. And at each grade level, they are further interpreted. But what this now allows is, for example, for sixth grade teachers to talk with eighth grade teachers about how it is that they're approaching vocabulary development or writing development or reading comprehension development because now we have a language that we can hold in common as well. And that language are those anchor standards. There are six shifts um, uh, in general that the Common Core State Standards challenge us to look at in terms of English language arts. And largely is an emphasis on more exposure to informational text. This of course is not new information for middle school students, but, or for middle school teachers, but it certainly um, will be helpful for us in the coming years that our elementary um, uh, colleagues uh, are also looking at how to create more opportunities for informational text to be in front of students from the time that they begin to learn how to read. It's an important part of how it is that we build content knowledge. Another shift is in looking at how literacy is developed um, at the grade 6-12, especially through science, um, history, social studies, and the technical subjects, as well as in English. This, of course, has been uh, something that, that all of us have long advocated for, and that many people, many content teachers, as well as English teachers, do informally. But what the Common Core Standards uh, offer to us is a more formal way to be able to have those conversations with our colleagues. Uh, really building that disciplinary knowledge that students need. And again, this plays an important role in terms of their vocabulary development in middle school. As well, there are shifts around text complexity, certainly in raising uh, the level of complex text that students are expected to be able to read and understand. And related to that, our use as teachers of text-dependent questions that cause students to go back into the text to reread. And I think these two ideas together are key in what happens. We want to pose questions to students that cause them to have to look back into the text to be able to understand what it is that they're reading. Um, it's, it's hard to motivate uh, sixth graders, quite frankly, to simply read and then read again and then read again. And these text-dependent questions are meant to give them a purpose or a reason or an authenticity to be able to reread portions of the text in order to pull out those deeper meanings. Another shift is around argumentation. Argumentation uh, begins to be more formally defined beginning in sixth grade. In K-5, they really don't talk about argumentation, but rather opinion uh, as, as being a lead up to more formal argumentation that begins in grade six. So again, our elementary colleagues are working on uh, setting the stage for students to be able to engage in argumentation, which we're expected to bring them through as we go into middle school. Argumentation especially, um, and you may recall from your own college experiences as well, um, is the ability to be able to read, write, um, speak, and listen uh, in ways in which you're able to organize first of all, what your claims are or what your opinions are, and to be able to support those claims or warrants or opinions with evidence. Not simply saying, well, I think this way because I think this way, but rather in looking at the evidence that a text or a series of texts um, have to offer for us.
And then finally, this focus on academic vocabulary. And hooray that there is this focus, um, because uh, this is our opportunity as educators to help our colleagues understand that vocabulary learning is not simply memorizing a list of individual words, but rather it's your ability to be able to apply those words, apply those terms in ways that are meaningful in reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Um, vocabulary, uh, it's useful uh, to consider, is really a proxy for the concepts that you know and understand. Um, and so in that regard, uh, it's helpful for us to think about vocabulary development as being more than just memorizing a list of words, but rather connecting those words, those terms, those phrases with the content, with the discipline itself. Um, our timing, I think, was really fortuitous in the sense that just about the time that the uh, Common Core State Standards were coming out, we were working on this program. My colleague Doug Fisher and I um, uh, had begun working with Sadlier and had approached them with some ideas about how to look at vocabulary in a different kind of way. And as I said, the timing, I think, with the Common Core State Standards uh, coming out really was serendipitous uh, for us because we were able to incorporate uh, many of the ideas into the program and in other ways the Common Core State Standards reinforce for us approaches that we've already been using for many years and I'm sure that you're using as well. Um, as you as you probably know, with uh, with uh, Common Core um, State Standards, there are a couple of overarching goals um, that are related to this. One certainly is providing rigorous content and applications of higher knowledge, and this is meant to occur especially through uh, causing students to use those higher order thinking skills, both in their reading and writing as well as in their speaking and listening. Another is to meet college and career expectations. Um, it, this is really, I think, a, an idea that's important for us to keep front and central. You know, we're, we're thinking about middle schoolers. We're working with um, students that are 12 or 13 or 14 years old. And in their minds, while they may think that their career um, or their college intentions are light years away, we know better. We as adults know that it really is just around the corner. And while we don't expect a 12-year-old um, to necessarily be able to articulate all of his uh, life plans, including um, college and career plans, we do want to make sure that their time that they spend in secondary education especially is a time where they get to explore lots of different opportunities and uh, to think about uh, fields that they had never perhaps given consideration to before. We want to make sure that we're exploring exposing them not only to a range of ideas, but also equipping them with the kinds of uh, tools, the kinds of study habits, the kinds of habits of mind that they're going to need as they move into either post-secondary education or into career paths. Another overarching goal is, of course, to have them succeed in what is becoming, um, uh, with every day that goes by, uh, a, a global society that seems to be closer and closer. Um, uh, the idea, even a couple of years ago, that we would talk about 21st century skills almost seems in some ways um, to be passe. I, I think it's Heidi Hay Jacobs who likes to point out that the 21st century is 12% over. Um, and we should be making sure that uh, we're preparing students and equipping students not only for what it is they need today, but again for the thinking habits that they're going to need for tomorrow. Um, and uh, this, uh, this relates to this last overarching goal too, which is that we want them to be a literate person. 
Um, we want them to be a learned person. We want them to be able to take forward ideas that they've learned in school um, into their own adult lives. The challenge for us as educators, I think, is that we have to prepare students for a future that we can hardly conceive of. And of course, this has always been the case. Um, uh, every generation of teachers prepares students for a future that does not yet exist. But um, the, the rapidity of how things are changing is really breathtaking. And while we can't necessarily foresee what the tools are going to be that are available for students to use as they move into adulthood, we can be really sure about the thinking and the collaboration that's needed for them to be successful regardless of what the tools are. And as I had pointed out before, these anchor standards are key. There are 10 anchor standards in reading. There are another 10 anchor standards in writing. There are six anchor standards in vocabulary. And there are six standards in uh, speaking and listening. And so I hope you're beginning to see that that vision that the developers had of uh, making sure that there were fewer of these standards and that they were clearer um, uh, is uh, a reality that we're now beginning to see. Uh, this is something that I do in uh, my classroom and um, and that is that I will often use a tool. This, ha this tool happens to be Wordle um, and Wordle is a great way to be able to um, uh, look at and understand through semantic analysis what a piece of text um, offers. These are This is a Wordle of the grade 6-12 reading standards and the relative size of a word tells you something about about its frequency and therefore its relative importance um, as it relates to the entire piece of text. And as you look at those uh, grade 6, 12 reading standards, um, I'm sure you can see that some words really come out at you. They are, of course, uh, based in text. That's the largest uh, word that we see. But we also are seeing um, especially imp uh, important verbs like analyze and determine. Um, we're seeing important nouns like evidence and meaning uh, as well. And we want to make sure that students are able to use this. This, by the way, is another tool that I use as well whenever I want to highlight what the important vocabulary is in a reading passage as well. Um, in grades 6 through 12, of course, um, uh, the disciplines are very dominant. And um, as I mentioned before, uh, science history and math, as well as English, um, play a role in how it is that we're developing students' um, literacies and especially their discipline-specific literacies. And that's an important notion to hang on to when we're talking about grades 6 through 12. Um, the different disciplines offer different opportunities um, for students to be able to use their literacy skills. This is a marked change from the exposure that students get at the elementary level. Um, looking at uh, what reading looks like, for example, in science. Well, they're reading science articles, for example. Um, what uh, language uh, looks like in mathematics has to do with their ability to be able to um, publicly defend and provide a rationale for their answers, while writing in English, for instance, might be around research papers. The genres of these begin to change and begin to become more different from one another as they go into middle school and high school. The um, uh, as well, one of those anchor standards um, that I had mentioned is around text complexity. And again, what I've tried to do is just pull out particular words and make them larger for you um, so that you can really see what the message is. Um, and the message around this is simply that students need to be able to read and comprehend a range of complex text, both informational as well as literary text. Um, as well, these key ideas and details um, around reading are important. They need to be able to read closely and to reread. 
uh, what it is that they're looking at to be able to determine those central ideas and summarize as well as to analyze um, uh, around uh, individuals perhaps events or ideas and how those develop across a piece of text um, another anchor standard, uh, another set of anchor standards is around the integration of knowledge and ideas, um, especially in making sure that students are exposed to content that comes in a variety of formats, um, that they understand how argument and claims work in a variety of different genres, as well as to be able to pull out the evidence that they see. Um, the, uh, another set of anchor standards um, within those 10 are around craft and structure. And here's where we really begin to get into the vocabulary uh, part of it, um, around interpreting words and phrases, understanding um, what their technical, their um, connotation as well as denotation, figurative meaning, specific word choices, and how those word choices can shift the meaning or the tone of a piece of text. We also want students to be able to analyze those texts at the level of sentences and paragraphs as well as how they relate to the whole and to understand as well that an author's point of view or purpose um, plays a role in what that text is going to look like. Um, the, um, within the the program itself, um, uh, you'll find opportunities to be able to teach um, uh, especially the denotative uh, or definitional um, meanings of the words. Um, uh, they are uh, arranged for them in uh, in formats that are meant to be uh, useful and understandable to them, and then to expand those word meanings. You know, the idea of connotation that words can um, can take on more than one meaning depending on how they're how they're being used um, uh, is an important one, and we want to expand their ability to be able to understand that words can have multiple meanings along the way. Um, and as I noted before, um, uh, as always, we need to remember that science and social studies and the technical subjects should be fully involved in all of this, and that includes in their vocabulary development. Um, uh, another feature that you'll find in the program is that uh, each unit of instruction um, alternates between a science reading and a history reading. Um, we want to uh, make sure that the words that students are learning are deeply connected to the discipline. Um, and to the concepts and the ideas. As well, uh, in those history and science readings, um, you'll also note that there are a range of genres that are available. For example, the one that you see here on the screen is obviously a history reading, and it's an, uh, specifically the genre is an oral history. It's arranged in terms of uh, an interview. That's a different kind of reading than what uh, than, than what might occur, for example, in a historical account of um, somebody arriving at Ellis Island. And those uh, subtle shifts in genres have implications in terms of vocabulary meaning. Um, uh, we also want to, within um, uh, their understanding of vocabulary use and acquisition, we want to equip students in uh, being able to figure out unknown words. I, and this is so important for middle school students especially. Um, you can't be there to unpack for them every word that they might run into that they don't know. We have to equip them with the tools, the thinking skills that they need so that when they run into an unknown word and you're not around uh, to help them with that, that they can take apart that word, that they can analyze uh, the meaningful word parts, they can look at the context clues, or even use reference materials in order to solve those words and resolve those words on their own. 
um, two other features um, that we've embedded within the program speak to just that, um, especially around um, looking at meaningful word parts. Um, at various times uh, within the program, there's attention to uh, prefixes and suffixes. There's attention to Latin and Greek root words and understanding the denotation or the derivative, rather, of a word in order to be able to solve it. And we want students to be alerted to the fact that sometimes you figure out a word because of the context clues that are around. Uh, we also make sure that students have opportunities to be able to use references as well. Again, arming them with the kinds of tools, the problem solving tools that they need to solve those unknown words. Uh, we also want students to understand um, uh, what the nuances of words are. Um, uh, the use of figurative language, for example, or understanding how words relate to one another. Another feature that we have in the program uh, is around the use of idioms. Um, uh, I'm here in uh, San Diego. I'm about 15 miles uh, from the border uh, between uh, Mexico and the United States. And so you're probably not surprised that many students in my community are second language learners. It's a way in which we think about um, how it is that students learn. And uh, things like idioms, um, things like connotations of words can be especially vexing for English language learners. Now, they're hard for lots of other students who uh, are native speakers of English, but especially for English language learners, these can be very difficult for them because of the subtleties, because of the nuances, because of the fact that in many cases these are culturally bound or experientially bound. Um, and so we want to uh, give students opportunities to be able to uh, think about the words that they've been learning within a particular unit and considering them in terms of the idiomatic uses of them or the connotative uses of them. Um, we also want to make sure that um, students have an understanding and a growing um, uh, volume of words that they know. Um, both in terms of general academic words, um, in other words, words that are words and phrases that are applied across disciplines, um, words that are uh, highly um, uh, functional for them. And just by way of example, I would use words like create and deny. Those are, those are words that we use um, uh, across uh, disciplines, as well as those domain-specific uh, words and phrases. Um, uh, words and phrases that have uh, particular meanings when they are taught within the context of a, um, a specific discipline. And that at times, those word meanings can change because it's another discipline. We also want them to be able to independently gather that uh, vocabulary knowledge. Um, in doing so, uh, we gave careful consideration to uh, the sources of words that are in the 6-8 program. And we drew from three different uh, areas. The first is the basic word list. Um, these are um, words that uh, may be slightly below grade level, late elementary school um, uh, in particular, but that may represent an important gap between what it is that we think that students know and uh, perhaps what it is that they don't yet know. So some of the words, a, a, a portion of the words that are in the word list um, come from that basic word list. Um, we also draw from Marzano's background knowledge word list. These are the words especially that are domain specific. Um, what are the important terms that you need to know within science and history social science, for example, within math and English? Um, and we found those to be also um, a, an extremely useful uh, source of that knowledge. But we also wanted to look at those general academic words. Um, and that's where the academic word list came into play. If you're not familiar with the academic word list, it is a list of about 
570 words, and then if you take the variance, it becomes much larger than that. Um, uh, words that were developed um, by uh, analyzing uh, textbooks from 11 different disciplines, uh, crossing out or eliminating uh, the first 3,000 most common words, and then really paying attention to those academic words that go across all of those disciplines. And by um, creating a word list that pulled from these three areas, um, we hope that we have a word list in grades 6 through 8 that account for where some of the gaps might be. Um, looking at those domain specific uh, words that students need to know as well as those general academic words. And together the intent of this is to close the vocabulary gap. Um, as well, the way uh, the lessons are uh, arranged in the program use a gradual release of responsibility uh, instructional framework. And this is something that um, my colleague Doug Fisher and I have uh, been working on for the better part of a decade, uh, both in our own classrooms as well as in our research and our writing as well. And uh, the lessons that are in the program are aligned with these same ideas in mind. That there is a way in which um, we present uh, information to students around vocabulary, especially through a focus lesson. Um, and uh, in the program, this uh, comes in the form not only of um, information for the teacher to be able to share, but then there's um, there are um, videos, uh, short videos, um, uh, to be able to use with students, as well as um, audio files um, to use that well. So that students not only can get instruction at school, but they can access these same resources when they're away from school as well, because so many of them are online. We also want to make sure that there are opportunities for the kind of collaborative learning uh, that students do together in the company of their peers with their teacher being able to provide guided instruction for them while students are working collaboratively. Um, that collaborative learning is key for students to be able to know and understand, especially in looking forward to what it is that they'll be expected to do in college or in their careers. And then finally, as they move towards mastery, uh, to be able to um, uh, use the words in a more independent fashion, both through speaking as well as through writing. Um, the goal overall, as I said, was to incorporate um, uh, many of the elements of the Common Core State Standards into the program and to couple that with the work that, uh, that we've been doing for many years around uh, gradual release. And uh, we hope that uh, in being able to do that, um, we've been able to uh, bridge that gap for students in terms of their vocabulary learning. And Laura, am I right that it's a, a question and answer time at this point? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have um, the questions. Um, just to remind you, if you have any questions for Nancy, to please uh, type them in the chat box, chat, the chat box to the right of your uh, screen in the control panel. Um, Nancy, I have two questions here that we can start, and maybe um, as you answer them, others could ch uh, write in their questions. Um, the first question is, how often should I teach vocabulary to my sixth grade class? Oh, that's a great question. Um, uh, and. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give uh, two answers to that. Um, my, my first short answer is every day. Um, and uh, my second answer is you're doing it in lots of different ways. Um, in terms of um, a specific vocabulary time where you're introducing new words and phrases uh, to students. Um, that's something that is occurring um, every day or nearly every day in your classroom for shorter periods of time as you're introducing those words to students. And that introductory part of the instruction is of course important, but it's not sufficient. Um, and I, um, I would uh, 
uh, connected to how it is that many of us have learned a second language or not learned a second language. If it was enough to hear somebody else use language, that all I had to do was listen to it, then I should be able to speak Spanish fluently. I'm surrounded by it all the time. But it's not sufficient enough for me to merely listen to that language. I have to produce that language as well. Um, and so the other part of vocabulary instruction is not just introducing it, but making sure that there are opportunities for students to produce that. As we, um, as we talk about um, vocabulary um, instruction, it's important to note that we're really teaching an academic language. We may not be teaching um, Spanish or French or German or Japanese, but we're teaching an academic language. And in order for students to be able to um, acquire the kind of academic language that's necessary in middle school and high school, we have to give them opportunities to produce it. And again, that happens every day as well. So instruction around vocabulary happens every day. The shorter part of it is the introduction to those words and phrases. The longer part of it and the part that's woven in and out of your instruction are those opportunities for students to be able to produce it in their speaking as well as in, in their writing. Thank you. Um, here's another one. It says, asks, what is the most effective way to teach embedded vocabulary in high school? And by embedded vocabulary, I'm going to assume that that means vocabulary that's occurring within a piece of connected text. Um, I think I'm, so. I'm, it says teach slash embed. Oh, okay, okay. Um, you know, and this is this is one of the um, uh, the areas that we're really thinking about um, in terms of especially a close reading. Um, as I said, within the program, uh, all of the um, all of the units start with a reading, and um, consistent with all of that, what we try to do is to um, uh, not front load too much of that vocabulary in advance of the reading. In other words, we want students to encounter those words and begin to figure out what those words mean before I've done any direct instruction on all of that. Because it's essential to understand that vocabulary isn't just memorizing a list of words in isolation. It is always a proxy for the concepts and the ideas that that word or phrase represents. And so whenever, um, whenever we're teaching vocabulary that's embedded in text, we make sure that students first have an opportunity to encounter that in their reading, and then we follow up immediately afterwards with some more direct instruction um, that includes um, uh, understandings about that vocabulary. But it's really important that we don't um, remove for them any reason to have to read in the first place. We want them to run into those words that they may initially struggle with, and then we teach teach them about how it is that you figure out what those words mean. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, here's one. Uh, if you are in a context where the English is taught as a foreign language, then how can you introduce your elementary students to a range of disciplines? I want to make sure that I also that I understand the question. So um, in looking at um, uh, English as second language instruction, um, uh, how might, can you tell me the question one more time? Laura, can you finish the end of it? Sure. Um, how can you introduce your elementary students to a range of disciplines? Ah, OK. So. Um, I, and while I don't know the context specifically of what happens in uh, that English as a second language classroom, my assumption is that we want to make sure that students are exposed to um, uh, lots of different perspectives. They're exposed to content. They're not just exposed to the learning of the language itself. 
Um, and so in that regard, um, using readings um, that relate to um, that relate to the natural world, that relate to the political world, that relate to imagination are just as essential for those elementary students who are learning English as a second language as they are for an older student who is a native English speaker. We always want to ground um, those ideas and those words into a more meaningful pattern. Now it may require, perhaps again I don't know the, the context of the instruction, it may require that initially you're lowering um, uh, the text demand uh, um, that's placed on students so that you can build up some of that background knowledge and then using um, an increasing level of text complexity you're staircasing up their ability to be able to engage in over time more complex uh, more complex text hmm. I hope I answered that question I hope for that person and if I didn't please um, please type in a follow-up to that okay um, here's one. Um, how can I get the academic vocabulary go, bleh, vocabulary words that are across the subject areas? Um, if you uh, so, I assume you're you're uh, referring to the academic word list. Um, uh, it's widely available online. The woman who uh, was the researcher who published it, her name is Avril Coxhead, and uh, it is sometimes called the Coxhead word list, but it is more commonly called the academic word list. And if you put that into Google and put um, quotation marks around it, academic word list, and then perhaps type in uh, her last name, Coxhead, um, you'll come up with any one of a number of sites um, that have it. Her work comes out of uh, a university in New Zealand. So if you see a New Zealand connection to it, you know that you're on the right path. But it is widely available. I believe it's also even on Wikipedia. Nancy, uh, that's all the questions we have in the queue. Um, thank you so much um, for for being here today. Um, I want to advance this slide because I know you have a thank you in many languages. Um, and I want to thank our uh, attendees for coming and, and listening uh, to Nancy. Um, we will, this has been recorded and we will be sending you all a, an email with a link to the recording which will have this PowerPoint and so you can share, you can watch it again and you can share it with your colleagues. Um, we will edit out all the advanced slides, uh, verbal uh, directions from Nancy to me. Um, but I just want to thank Nancy again for uh, being here this afternoon, Nancy. Thank you and thanks to all of you too for spending the, uh, some time this afternoon with me.